I'm not going to spend today talking about um, lots of prophecies and stuff like that, but I want to just let you know that God is coming soon. You can see it around you, amen. The question you got to always ask yourself is, are you ready? I hope you're awake, amen. It's right. Hallelujah. Turn your neighbor and ask, are you ready for him? Amen. You know, I, I always find the funniest thing, uh, whenever you teach a, a, pro a class about Revelation or, or a study on Revelation, there's always one person that will ask, hey, so when is Jesus coming? Anybody had that experience or something like that? I've always noticed that. And, you know, the, the answer to that question is, well, are you ready right now? Because that's what, that's what matters, amen? That's what matters. You don't need to get into a long, drawn-out discussion about when is Jesus coming because, you know, in Matthew chapter 24, there's a little scripture that talks about if the, you know, if the good man in his house was, was ready, if he knew the thief was coming, you'd prepare for him. And, you know, there's a little story about a guy who said, oh, I know that my Lord delays his coming, so I'm going to have a party. I'm going to go eat with the drunken. I'm going to go have a great time. I'm going to go beat the people that work for me to death. Well, I mean, not to death because that's horrible. But but then there's a little thing that after that says, well, th you're really not smart because the Lord's coming for you tonight. That's the Aaron Scheidel version of, the, of that scripture there. I need an amen because anybody read that? I've read that. I read that. Amen. Hallelujah. How's everybody doing with their Bible reading this, this, this year? On track? Maybe one or two days behind? Come on, be honest, amen. You are in the house of God. There is an altar up here. It's okay, amen. Hallelujah. Got to stay on track with that Bible reading, amen. Got to, amen. Got to check in. I, w I was just, um, we, were we were reading last night, and, and our little plan said that we were 10% done. And I thought to myself, man, it felt like the year just started. Anybody have that feeling? You know, the Lord, he, he's speeding things up a little bit. A and I'm, I say it's the Lord because he's got some scriptures that said he was going to speed some stuff up. And, you know, if you, if you don't look around you, if you don't prepare yourself, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you don't come just a half an hour before service starts for prayer, you're going to short yourself. You're going to find out, gee, I thought I had more time. I could have I could have won more souls. I could have talked to that person, but I didn't have the time. Church, I'm just here to tell you here today that we need to use the time God gave us. We need to be on fire for him. He has called us. I'm so excited about what pastor's doing with this ministry thing. And if you filled out something for ministry last week that you're excited about doing or interested in doing, you need to pursue that. Amen. You need to talk to your pastor, be in talks with your pastor, in communion with him and say, yeah, what do I need to do to be a minister, to be a better minister, to further the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom? Because that is what God has called each and every single one of us to do. Not just get baptized in Jesus' name, get filled with his Holy Ghost and be done. He wants us to be laborers, amen? His Bible, his Bible that he wrote, authored for us, I should say, says that there, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. If, if you look around in your school, young people, if you look around in your workplace, if you look around in your city that you live in, your neighborhood, the harvest is right there. The souls are hungry for something. They're crying out for something. When you look at the politics, they're all looking for something, some change, some sort of change. Something different needs to happen. The same old, same old just isn't working. You can see it in their personal lives. Marriage is failing all because Jesus isn't in the marriage in the first place. That's the main reason. But you know what? They're hungry, and you've got what they need. Amen? Anybody thought that lately? I've been thinking that more and more. I've been reflecting more and more. What is my time spent on? What is my time spent on? You know, the question is, are you going to be ready for him? January had some really good struggles, didn't it? I know some families in this church had some struggles, not just through January, but before January. And pastor has said to me, he has said to this church, that fasting has a way of just bringing that out. Just not, 
just bringing that knowledge to the front of your brain. It's always been there. That struggle with sin has always been there. That struggle in your family, it's been there. But fasting seems to just bring it to the front of your mind that says, hey, you've been dealing with this, and it's time to be delivered from it. I said it's time to be delivered from it. Come on, be, be with me. It's okay. To, it's okay. Wake yourself up. Amen. Hallelujah. Fasting is going to brought that breakthrough. When I say fasting, connecting to Jesus. That's why this connection prayer that we, all, that we keep on doing, I feel like it at first kind of rolled my eyes and said, Pastor's got a new thing. Did any, anybody else have that? You, you don't have to be honest. You don't have to be honest with me. You just got to be honest with Jesus, okay? At first, I was like, there's one more thing he's going to make us do. But then as we kept on doing it, I felt that connection. I felt that, hey, we're moving out of our seats. We're moving out of our ordinary, and we're praying for people that we don't normally pray for. I, I, don't, I don't normally run over and, and, just, and just pray with Brother Jim Rosine all the time. I love to every time I do, but it doesn't always normally happen. And I'm so glad that pastor's le- leading us in that direction. Amen. I don't grab a, a little child and say, hey, let's go pray. I ask their parent first, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm so thankful that this connecting has happened because it's, it's, pra- it's giving us practice because you are that, that middle generation, essentially. You're connecting the world to Jesus. He's been around forever. He's that older generation. He's been around forever, literally, forever. He's been around, amen? And we need to connect them, the world, to Jesus. That is our job, our mission. Amen? That is our job, our mission. Amen? It's okay to shout amen in a Pentecostal church. Amen? Hallelujah. You can speak it. Amen? Hallelujah. 2016 was, a, was it, it's not a time to be sitting on the fence for the Lord. You know, I, I bet that gets preached about every, every January, okay? But it's, it's February now, so I'm going to still preach it. Because it's not a time to be on the fence for Jesus. I keep on being reminded of what Brother Becker brought out in that little slide of just two colors, black and white. And how, how true is that, that you've got these, these polar extremes. You are for Jesus or you are not for Jesus. You're against him. And then there's that middle territory. Well, I'm here to tell you that 2016, probably maybe 17 and 18, but I tell you what. That's gonna, that gray area, that on the fence is going to get shorter and shorter. You have to make a decision. You're going to have to, amen, in your prayer life, in your Bible reading. That's where these decisions are made. Are you keeping up with your Bible reading? Are you keeping up with your personal devotions? Are you praying as a family? That's going to keep you on the light side, so to speak. It's going to keep you on that white part, on that being a child of the light. Don't be on the fence, amen? I don't want to be spewed out. Lift up your hand and say, I'm not going to be spewed out, Lord. I'm going to be on fire. Lord, heat me up. Heat my passion up, amen? Burn a fire within me. I love that song that the young people had been singing um, for jam night. The fire song. Sarah, how does it go? I got a fire burning inside of me. I'm not good at remembering words and songs. You all know that. You need to help me out. It was good? All right. I've got a fire burning in me. And you know what? It's got to get hotter. And the way it gets hotter is prayer. Okay? Pastor's not a broken record. He literally is intentionally saying we need to pray every time he gets up here. It's not that he's broken. It's that the scripture says it over and over again. So pastor feels the need to preach it every now and again. Amen? We need to pray. We need to make that little extra effort to come a half an hour before the service actually starts. Amen? I'm preaching to some people here just because that prayer is important. You need a breakthrough in your walk with God, and that means you need prayer. And it's okay to need prayer. It is okay to admit, I need prayer. It doesn't mean you're admitting that you are broken and you're a sinner and you're a rotten person. It's admitting that you're a human and you're not perfect. Amen. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. If we're going to spread this gospel, we need Jesus. 
We can't spread our own gospel. Every time that has happened, it's ended in failure. There have been ministers that go out on their own, try to do their own thing, preach their own ideas, and that's exactly what it is, a one-man show. Jesus isn't in it. That's why I'm so thankful for a pastor who prays. He prays for you. He prays for me. He cries for you and me. He's prayed those hours over us, and I'm so thankful for that man of God. We need to pray for him in return. In fact, I think each of us needs to invest in a little bit of a little whiteboard that we can write our prayers on, that can remind us, put it right next to our bedside, put it right next to where we go on our on our refrigerator, wherever. Put it somewhere where you go, back and forth. You need that prayer reminder. You need to pray. Amen. Well, I tell you what, if you know you need to pray, you know you need to evaluate where are you? Where is your walk with God? Are you going towards him or are you sliding away from him? Pastors said it before, and I love it. There's no stay where you are in, in God. You've got to move toward him or you're sliding back. You've got to move forward, forward toward him or you're sliding back. And I tell you what, there's some things that are going to distract you this year, distract you from your walk with God, distract you from your ministry because that is your walk with God. We need to, as a church, not separate those two. Your walk with God is your ministry. Your walk with God is what God wants you to do. And, and you know, sometimes he doesn't tell you where he's taking you. Can I get an amen? Amen. When, when Abraham got the message, you got to go, that's all he said to Abraham. I'm sure, he, you know, if I was Abraham, I'd be, Lord, where? Just tell me where and I'll go. I'm really willing. Just tell me where. But he didn't tell him where. He just said, yeah, just go. Just in that direction over there? Yeah, just go. Man, sometimes it is difficult to know what the Lord wants you to do. But then, uh, you know, I'm reminded that's only when you're not praying. That's only when you're not fasting. That's only when you're not reading your word of God. Because he'll give you an inkling. If you're reading your Bible, if you're connected to the Lord, you're not going to be distracted by the things that this world's trying to distract you with. I can start with some, some little things, okay? For every opportunity you have to spread the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. I'm going to say that a lot. Turn to your neighbor and say, gospel of the kingdom. Because God wants us to spread the gospel of the kingdom. And every time you get an opportunity to spread that gospel or to deepen your walk with God, follow along that path of ministry, there's going to be something in the world that's going to say, oh, I'd like your attention too. I'd like that attention. You know, there's, there'll be new movies that you can go and see, that you have the opportunity to go and see. There'll be new um, entertainment ideas that you have an idea to go and see. You know, I'm not preaching against entertainment. I'm not preaching against that. But I tell you what, your attention, your attention, if your movies, if your entertainment is taking your attention away from Jesus, taking your attention away from your attention to the gospel of the kingdom, well, that's what I got to preach against. Because that's what the word tells me to preach against. That's what the word tells me I need to preach against because priorities, I need my priority to be on Jesus. Lift up your hand and just say, I need my priority to be him. I need it. Amen. Don't say it like a, like a, uh, a liturgical, um, what, what do you call that? Chant. Gregorian chant. We're not Greg, okay? We don't need to chant like Greg. We can say it with enthusiasm because we got the joy of the Lord. Amen? Okay. Hallelujah. That was a small clap, but thank you, Brother Jim. You're the only one. I'm giving you credit, though, okay? Hallelujah. There's going to be demands on your job. There's going to be maybe opportunities in your job. And I'm not preaching against jobs, okay? I learned my lesson. Say, say one thing bad about one thing like sugar, and y'all think I'm against sugar. Sure tastes good. Amen. Hallelujah. But there's going to be demands. There's going to be requests, you know? Are you going you know, to you build your kingdom? Are you going to focus more on your kingdom, 
your castle, your nest egg, your retirement? Are you going to focus more on that than on giving to the kingdom? You got to you got to build something for yourself. You got to let the Lord take care of that. You know, but every sometimes when the, when the time comes, you're going to have to listen to the Lord. Cuz the Lord might say, "Hey, you know that that nest egg you've been building? You know that retirement you've been saving up for? Well, I've been having you save that up for the kingdom. And now is the time to just go get rid of that. Go give that retire in my kingdom." Amen. And I'm not just saying cute phrases here. I'm saying the Lord might ask that of you. Are you willing to let that go for his sake? I know that was tough. Okay, I know that was tough. But just think on that, amen? Think on that. Amen. And You know, there's, there's other distractions I want to mention. You know, this is a year of political elections and if there's ever something that would distract the kingdom, the people in the kingdom, it's something like an election. I've seen it in the past. I feel like, you know, nowadays, even more so, we need to be reminded that this country that we live in really doesn't matter when it comes to, when it's compared to the kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord. It doesn't matter who's, who's, who's the elected dictator or who's the elected president or whatever you really want to call them. What they do here on earth doesn't matter when it compares to eternity. It doesn't matter what law they pass. It might be against the Bible. And boy, does that, that, that grind you as a child of God, doesn't it? That's good because Ezekiel and, and the prophets, that the major prophets, they were torn up at that. They were angered at that. That's the anger we need to have that the world embraces Things that are against the Bible. Things like it's okay to marry whoever you want, whether it's a dog or a cat or a, or a person of the same, same gender. The Bible says you can't do that. I was just reading last night with my kids, and Moses is getting some law, and it says you, you really shouldn't fool around with, with dogs and cats, okay? That's why God gave us humans, okay? All right? But it also said things like, the witch, you can't let her live. You got to kill the witch. You got to let that go. And you know, in this day and age, I think we need to preach that because there's some Harry Pottering. I'm not saying kill witches, okay? All right, stop for a second. I'm not saying go kill people. All right, don't take me out of context. All right, church, can I get an amen? Okay, all right, good. But I think we need to kill some attachments to things because it can be, tempting, I think, for some young people to want to go watch things like Harry Potter or some wizardry thing because all their friends are doing it. And it's a cool movie, right? You want to just jump into that, right? But we got to hold back a little bit and draw some lines in our life. Draw some lines. Amen? We've got to draw lines. Where will I not go? What will not distract me? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We need to stop ourselves. Hallelujah. Not only from that, but, you know, this is something the Lord deals with me about political things. Am I more inclined to try to persuade somebody politically than I am pers to persuade somebody spiritually? Do I want to spend my time trying to change their mind on, a, on something politically, on a person, or do I want to Try to persuade them on the person that matters, on Jesus. Am I com more concerned about how they vote or about how their soul's going to end up? God's been kind of pricking my heart a lot lately on that because I've noticed a lot of times it's easier for me to talk about things like that than it is about the Bible. And there's a reason for that I'm going to go through because you know what? You've got the best thing in the world. That is the gospel of the kingdom. That is the gospel of the kingdom. If you're not sure what the gospel of the kingdom is, it's what Jesus did. It's that he was here on earth, and it's that he died for us, and that he was buried, amen, and that he rose again. Hallelujah. And that we need to apply that gospel to our hearts, to our lives, amen. 
I want to go to Matthew chapter 24. I read this a couple days ago, I think, in my Bible reading with the girls. And this is my favorite piece of Scripture because it's, because it's Jesus talking. It's also Jesus talking about, about the end times. And boy, does that just get me excited because did you know Jesus comes in the end times? Amen. J- Jesus comes in the end times. I don't want to spoil the end, but I will. He comes again, amen, on a horse, and he just knocks everybody flat who's against him, which makes me want to be for him, amen. Amen. Are you on the fence right now? Come on, church. Are you in the gray area? If you are, you get off to that left side. Or not, maybe not, I don't know, left. If I'm looking up here, it's left, but get on the white side, amen. Get on the light side. Get on the Lord's side, amen. Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to start with verse 4. His, verse 3, his disciples ask, hey, Lord, tell us about the end. And Jesus starts setting them straight. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. Look to your neighbor and say, don't be deceived. Look to him again and say, no, I really mean it. Okay? I think it's so telling when it comes to this. The, his disciples ask him about the end times, and Jesus says, hey, don't be deceived, okay? Don't let anybody deceive you. Amen? The only way that you're going to avoid deception, and I don't mean just, I don't, I don't mean end time prophecies and stuff like that right now. What I'm saying is don't be deceived by the things of this world. That's what he's starting us out as. If the only way you're going to avoid deception is to remain in the light. You have got to be a child of the light. You, if you've got the Holy Ghost, you are a child of the light. If you do not have the Holy Ghost, you need it. You need it to avoid the deception that's going to happen in this world. You need it. You need it. I'm going to reference back to that black and white. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, I'm going to say you're in the gray area right now. You're in the gray area, and you need to get over to the Lord's side. You need to get over to his side, amen? And the Holy Ghost is the way you do that. Staying in your Bible reading, staying in the Word, staying in your prayer life, keeping a prayer life. That's what's going to keep you from being deceived, amen? And he keeps on going in verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. You know, did you know that we live in a day that there's wars and rumors of wars? Did you know there's been some war that had broken out in a country called Yemen? Did you know that that there, there there was these secret wars that keep on happening that you might not even know about? Um, our current president, he's a peace president, but he's started more wars than than anybody else. Well, all in, yeah, sure. Um, I checked it out. He's got the peace prize, and he's bombed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different countries. Not just once, okay, but a sustained effort. We, when we're talking, when the Bible says rumors of wars, did you know any of that was happening? If you're keeping up and you're digging and you have to dig, then it's there. You can see it. But ru- ru- wars and rumors of wars. I mean, you can think about the war the war against Syria. It was a rumor, wasn't it? There was, there was some buildup for it. There was some prep for it. They were trying to convince people to go. But let me tell you, we live in a time where there is wars, and there is rumors of wars. And I just keep going back to James. Why do you fight amongst each other? Why do you have wars? It's because you don't have what you want. It's because, you, and, and then he goes on and says, you got to ask for it. But you, when you ask, you can't ask amiss. He's speaking to us, but... Because sometimes, you know, church, sometimes we have wars in our church. Sometimes you have wars with your brother and your sister. Some of you some of you do it on Facebook. Some of you do it on Facebook Messenger. Some of you do it on texting. Most of it's just miscommunica- miscommunication. You need to stop those wars with your brothers and your sisters. You need to, because this is a time where you can't be on the fence. 
You can't let something as trivial as a, as a, a little skirmish in words with your brother and your sister in the Lord, you can't let that pull you out of your walk with God. You can't let that pull you out of your ministry he's putting you in. Some of you are being stopped in your ministry. You can't move forward because of some petty little word fights that you're having with your brother and sister right now. Just so you know, I don't know of any right now, so I'm not speaking to any, okay? The Lord just wanted me to throw that at you, okay? It is good. Amen. Hallelujah. I like how this verse 6 keeps going, though. It talks about wars and rumors of wars. But he says, see that ye be not troubled. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be troubled about it. Don't be troubled about it. For all these things must come to pass, that the time is not yet. It strikes me when the Lord says, don't be troubled about all that. Because there are more important things to think about. Just like I was saying a little bit ago, it doesn't matter what's happening with all the politics so much. Because what's happening in, in the kingdom? How is the gospel being spread in La Crosse County? That's the politics you really got to matter about. The spirit, amen? The spiritual battles. How is the gospel of the kingdom being spread in Trempolo County, in La Crosse County, in Jackson County? These counties that we as a church have influence towards because we're around them. We're in them. How is that being influenced? That's what needs to trouble us. That's what we need to take our time up with. That's what we need to spend our prayer time with. Amen? Amen. The Lord is saying we shouldn't be troubled with this because we got other things to worry about. we got other things to deal with. Amen? Those are the world's issues. When they're, when they're throwing bombs around, when they're throwing all that around, when they're fighting in the politics and calling each other silly names because... Because they're silly. Amen. We don't need to worry about that. That shouldn't worry us. Amen. And I tell you what, more and more so, I feel myself being detached from that circle, that, in, that, that circle of influence. I, I, it, just a little testimony, personal. I was working at Quick Trip one time, and I'm a very cynical person when it comes to the world nowadays. And there was this elderly man. He must have been in his 60s or 70s. And I made a comment about, oh, you can't, can't trust that, can't worry about that. And he was like, you're a little young to be cynical. So I said, well, I just figured I'd cut to the chase if I'm going get to the, get to the real understanding of things. And he's like, well, good, you're a wise young man. And now it sounds like I'm boasting myself up, so I apologize. But... <laughs> It's good to just separate yourself from the world. When you worry about it, when you spend time on it, I tell you what, it's, a, it's distracting. It's a distraction, amen? Distraction from your purpose, your ministry, your walk with God. It seems really small, doesn't it? But a lot of small things add up. Um, I, just recently, just to... Em, just to emulate this point of small things add up, uh, I was working with my other math teacher over at the school the other day, and we were working on how to how to prep students up for the ACT, and and there was this one there's this one strategy that that somebody put up put on the on on, on internet something so that said just do the questions on the test booklet, and then go fill in the bubbles after the test. The reason being takes maybe two to five seconds to go from the booklet to the answer bubble and to fill it in. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it, Lou? Two to five seconds. But when you multiply two to five seconds by 60 questions, you end up with an extra five minutes on your time. That sounds like a whole lot on a 60-minute test, doesn't it? Lou, come on. He's in shock right now. I said the word test. He's he said he's been delivered from that. I'm bringing up horrible memories. Sorry, Brother Lou. But just those little few seconds, I had never thought about the littlest kind of thing like that. Adds up over time. Adds up over time. And all of a sudden, it feels like a big chunk that's been wasted. Amen? A another point, I played this one little silly game that 
on a phone or something that you just you just touch and it's like a you go up and down and, and in the in the in the settings or statistics because I love statistics it says how much game time you've played this was like a year or so ago and it said something like 36 hours of game time played and this wasn't over a straight okay okay I'm not saying I'm playing games just straight okay this was just intermittently okay but I was looking at that like my goodness that's more than a day and a half can you imagine a day and a half just doing math that sounds like a waste doesn't it the reason it sounds like a waste is because it because it is a waste it don't accomplish anything does it just to see that little small things over time add up what are your little small things that are adding up over time what little things in your walk with God are taken away from prayer time, are taken away from Bible reading, are taken away from that. Amen? Check yourself. Write some stuff down. When you're praying, ask the Lord these things. Amen? I'm not, I don't want to be the driving the axe against your prayer life, okay? I'm not the one chasing you right now. I just want to tell us as a church, we need to pray more. If we're going to reach La Crosse County, if we're going to grow this, this church and build churches from this church, we need to be on our face in prayer. Amen? Amen. Verse, verse 7 and 8 continues in Matthew 24. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. This sounds depressing, doesn't it? Good. Nobody amen that. That's awesome. I'm glad. None of you depressed by that. Because the word scripture just told us, don't worry about it. Amen. I'm glad you guys are listening. Like, yes. Hallelujah. Everything up to this point is just affecting the world that we live in. And it's just a distraction. That's all it is, is a distraction. But there's going to come a point in this world where Satan's going to ramp it up a little bit. And he's already begun to do that. Where it's going to be turned from just a distraction to persecution. And I don't mean persecution like, oh, you can't talk at school. That's not persecution, okay? That's, that's somebody telling you you can't say something. Well, guess what? You can still say it at home. You can still say Jesus in church. And you can still say Jesus in school. And you can still say Jesus in the, wor in the workplace. And you can still say Jesus at anywhere. What's stopping your vocal cords from saying the word Jesus? Try it out. Just to your neighbor. Ready? Go. Say Jesus. Okay, good. They all work. You can do it. Amen. Against such there is no law. And if there is, who cares? Amen. Who cares? If the if the if the Supreme Court or or the laws of the of the United States say you can't say Jesus on a plane, well, just go ahead and say Jesus on a plane. Who cares? Amen? It, it does not matter what laws are created that try to stop the gospel of the kingdom. Guess what? Your kingdom is better than their kingdom. Amen? Your kingdom is stronger than their kingdom. It's going to last a whole lot longer than their kingdom. You better stick on the winning side. Amen? Who cares what they want to do to you? Amen? Matthew 24, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Somebody say, ouch. They'll kill you. Somebody said, Ooh. and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now you say, yay. It's for his name's sake, okay? It's for his name's sake. I seem to remember some, some disciples later on in, in Acts that, that counted it all joy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And when they said suffer, they didn't mean their feelings were hurt. Your feelings really, that's not much, that don't matter too much. Because guess what? They change. Anybody been married? Anybody talked to a woman before? Or a man? Hey, I, you got to let me finish, okay? Don't, come on, don't keep fighting me, okay? If you talk to a person, the feelings change, don't they? Sometimes within minutes. Sometimes within seconds. Sometimes within a couple days, just depends who it is, amen? Because there's some chemicals going around in here, and whew, things change in there, don't they? 
But I tell you what doesn't change. The name of Jesus. Amen. The name of Jesus, the word of God, it don't change. You can depend on it. That's why you can suffer for the name of Jesus. It is there for always. It'll always be there for you. And tell you what, there is direct persecution against the church that is happening now. There is. There, and when I'm talking about the church right now, I'm not talking about the United States. There's not too much direct persecution that's happening. It's kind of subtle, and it's kind of on the fringe. But remember that slide of black, gray, and white? It's all going to just slide into where there's, you, gotta, you have to choose. You have to choose. You have to choose. And lately, you know, I've been praying, Lord, lead me to some hungry souls. Because if somebody has dedicated their life, you know, because there will come a point where you have to be for the Lord or you have to be against him. You have to. And there will be a point in every person's life where you, you can't turn around anymore. I hope and I pray that none of you are at that point where you can't turn around anymore. I hope that there are family members that you have that haven't reached that point right now. Everybody, I feel, has met somebody who has gone so far against God that they're, they've decided in their heart there is no going back. And I know God can change ever, anything. But tell you what, you don't want to. You don't want to sear that conscience. Amen? You don't want to sear that connection with the Lord. And if you have somebody who's going down that path in your family, you need to pray more for them. It doesn't matter what circumstance is going in their life? Your prayers will have an impact. I just had somebody tell me today that it doesn't matter if I pray for them or not. But I told them anyways. Yeah, it does matter. And I'm going to pray for you. Because it matters. Anybody been the recipient of prayer changing their life? Amen? I can testify. For years, I prayed for my dad. For years. When, when this church was older and there wasn't this black carpet up here anymore and I was about this tall, I think somewhere in here, yeah. The, Brother Dennis probably remembers this. There was anybody who wants to come up, come on up for prayer. And all the kids would filter in. They'd come up to the front. They'd come up with a limp. And they'd pray and they'd come back with a joy in their step. I don't know how much of it was fake and how much of it was real, but Lord, hallelujah, he heals. I remember that, amen? But every time I'd come up, I made sure I prayed for my dad because he wasn't in church. Monday morning, I'm sorry, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I made sure I went up there to pray for that dad of mine. And it only took five years, and he was in this church. There was a period of time where, where I, I saw him put a bunch of scriptures down. He's not here, so I can talk about him. I'll tell them. I'll tell them later. Don't worry. Um, but but I saw a bunch of scriptures on a piece of paper that were printed off Bible scriptures, and they were all about divorcement and and th you know things that that Moses you know gave him a bill of divorcement and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, he's reading his Bible. That's good. He's reading his Bible. How how I believe the Lord answered my prayers while he was do looking up those sorts of things because you know. God heals marriages, and I'm so thankful he healed my mom and dad's marriage. I don't know the half of what had happened. But, you know, when one of you's in the church and one of you's not, boy, that's difficult, isn't it? I don't know if some of you have been there, but that can't be easy. It, it, it's not because the Lord said don't do it. Amen? So prayer heals. Prayer gets answered. Prayer works. I feel that the Lord gave that idea to my dad to look up the scriptures just because it would drive him to the word of God. And I'm so thankful for God answering prayers. So don't ever think that your situation or your family member's situation is beyond repair because God can repair what seems cannot be repaired. Amen. He can raise up that. Amen. And when the, when the world begins to attack the church, when the world begins to attack us directly, 
threatening us with jail, not only threatening us but putting us in jail. Whether that happens in America or not, it doesn't matter because the gospel of the kingdom will be spread. Amen? Amen? In fact, when you persecute the church, it tends to grow. There are days when I think to myself, maybe I should pray for persecution. And then I think to myself, that seems dumb. I'm not going to pray for persecution. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, Lord. I know you answer prayers. I'm not going to pray for that. Amen? If you bring it on, Lord, hallelujah. But I don't want that to happen. Amen? You don't pray to bring on persecution. But I tell you what, if it happens, it's only going to grow you. Look at the church. They were stuck in Jerusalem, Lou. They stayed in Jerusalem. They said, we're having great church. This is awesome. Why move? Right? Well, the Lord said, well, I need you to move. I need you to spread this around. I can't keep you all in Jerusalem. So, persecution. Bless the Lord. It spread that church around. They got everywhere. And now, I'm preaching the word of God across the ocean from where it started. Thousands of years later, amen? If the church had not been persecuted in Jerusalem, it'd still be in Jerusalem, if not dead. God had a plan. God uses persecution. But, but, but what if they come at us with guns? Shouldn't we defend ourselves? That's between you and the Lord. But uh, I, I heard somebody... Somebody asked a preacher one time that same question. Are we supposed to just go before them like lambs of the slaughter? And I was really waiting for a good answer on this one. And, and it came out this way. Well, it's kind of what Jesus did. Boy, talk about a prick in my heart, amen. Talk about something that was preaching to me. And maybe, maybe you disagree with me. That's, that's fine. That's fine. It's between you and pastor, okay? If, if you don't like what I said, tell on me, please, okay? All right? But... Boy, did that speak to my heart. Kind of changed the way I thought about things. Maybe I need to be more like Jesus in every way. Because that sounds difficult in my mind. I feel like if they're going to come and take me away for preaching the gospel, I need to let that happen. I need to welcome that. I need to let that happen. Oh, hallelujah. You know, let's, let's go on. Amen? Because the... the the devil says that he's going to make war with the saints. The Bible says that the devil is going to make war with the saints. I'm not preaching this to, to bring us down. I'm preaching this to say, hey, we need to be ready. We can't be on the fence. There's a reason back in Revelation when we started that Jesus said, you're either going to be hot or cold, and I'm going to spew you out if you're, warm, if you're lukewarm. You're going to pretend to be a Christian on Sundays and Wednesdays so it looks fine for you. That's going to get spewed out church come on i want to stay hot i want to stay with the lord i want him to come and dine with me when he's come and dine the master calls come and dine just like that song oh we should sing that sometime amen let's move on matthew chapter 24 verse 10 says and then this is after the attacks and the persecutions and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another that sounds horrible doesn't it you know what I hear when I read this scripture? I think of today. There are so many people that are offended at so many things nowadays. If you say one thing, somebody guaranteed will be offended at it. It doesn't matter what you say. You can say the grass is green and somebody's going to be offended at that. I'm trying to say, I don't know, I'm trying to say the grass is green. I just testify right now at school sometimes. I'll, I'll, I'll just say a student's name. George? What? It wasn't me. I didn't do anything. I just said your name. That's all I said. Hi, how are you today? Go along your way. It feels like it's ingrained in people nowadays to be offended. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the defense of everything. Um. And you know what? If you want to offend somebody really good, you just say Jesus. Or you talk about the Bible. I'll, I'll do another testimony right now. When I was at school in the Crescent, I had some inquisitive students just ask about, about per, uh, things. About, 
about not not the Bible at all, but asked about abortion, ask about marriage, ask about this or that, and I gave answers just to that person, and I was talking just to that person. I wasn't talking to the whole class, and I mentioned the Bible, and I had to go to the principal's office. I hadn't been to the principal's office more. I've been more. I've been in the principal's office for being doing bad things, apparently, more as a teacher than I had as a student. I tell you what. I tell you what. My my Lord, he is good. But I tell you what. They do not like the name of Jesus. They do not like the answer that includes the Bible. When I say they, I mean the world. And the public schools are definitely part of the world. Amen? They are. And I just... You know, I count that all joy to be persecuted in that way. I, I kind of go back a lot of times in my mind and wish that I had said things like, you know, if you really do want to fire me, go for it. I love that. I kind of wish I would do that sometimes back in my head, but I can't time travel. Work on that later. Hallelujah. You know, it goes into political correctness. You've heard that before. You can't say this, can't say that, can't call this person this or that person that. Tell you what, it's supposed, and the, the, the aim of political correctness is supposed to be that you don't offend people or stop hate speech or stop this and not be hurtful, but it has the opposite effect, which is kind of the sort of same thing with any, any government action, right? It has the opposite intended effect. No, oh, amen. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Just dwell on that later, okay? Um, it just seems to have that opposite effect. And I think that this, 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 this idea of political correctness has intensified this idea of people being offended and being upset and dividing people more and more and more. But this is the day that we live in. You know what? That's okay, though. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus told us what he was going to do. Chap- Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 says, as Jesus talking, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. The Lord, he, he is offensive. This scripture is basically telling us that he's offensive. He's also going to come back to earth with a sword, literally, on his horse, okay? But, man, if you ever want to offend somebody or bring a sword into a conversation, you, you mention Jesus. You ask people how, how their relationship with Jesus is. Amen. I'm going to continue here. Just three more verses in Matthew chapter 24. Verse 11 says, Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Uh, when, I, when I read this, I was thinking, I'm so thankful. If you're, if you're not coming on Wednesday nights, you need to make sure you're here on Wednesday nights because Pastor has been leading a series on, on the world religions, and the first one he touched on was postmodernism. And this scripture kind of spoke right out to me when I was reading this the other day. False prophets shall arise and deceive many. I feel like that is postmodernism nowadays. In the Christian church, in the church, when Pastor was talking about you can be a Christian postmodernism, that's what the world says at least. That's a way to deceive people. That's a way to deceive people. That you can sit in church and make Jesus into what you want him to be. When, hey, that's kind of the other way around, isn't it? You gotta sit in church and turn yourself into what Jesus wants you to be. Amen. Amen. But I tell you what, the world is working and twisting the word of God in any way that it can to deceive many. And that's why the Lord said, don't be deceived. Turn your neighbor again and say, hey, don't be deceived. Amen. And because, verse 12, the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, amen, the same shall be saved. Verse 14, I want you to read this with me. And this gospel, somebody said, in this gospel, shall be preached, yes, in all the world, for a witness unto all nations. All right, now you got to say it with, with joy. And then shall the end come. See, you got to preach the gospel of the kingdom to all the world. Then the end's going to come, amen? Anybody want to go to Jesus? Get preaching. You just raised your hand. You volunteered. Go preach, amen? Go preach. That's how we get this gospel of the kingdom spread. Then, then we can go home, okay? We got to get that done. 
we got to get praying, amen? we got to get out there. The main focus of the gospel of the kingdom is to, is to spread the church, to grow the church. When, when Jesus, uh, let's see, Luke chapter 9, verse 2, that's the scripture I was trying to remember, Gary. You can go there, I know. Jesus sent his disciples specifically to preach the gospel of the kingdom. It says, and he sent them to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to heal the sick. Every time you see them preaching the gospel of the kingdom, it's accompanied with a few things. It's accompanied with a few things. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom always was accompanied with meeting the sick and the hurting where they are. Where they are. It's not just bringing them into church. It's going out of the church to where they are. Amen. Going to the hurting, the sick. You know where the sick are a lot of times? The hospital. Yeah, exactly, sister. You can go to the hospital, amen, and pray for people. You can go to the hospital and pray for people. You can do it, amen? Um, there's also hurting people at Salvation Army. I've, I've been there, and, and, man, they love it when you come see them. They do. Because, you know, there's a lot of people in this world that feel and know that no one cares. We just read it in Matthew 24. The love of many shall wax cold. But I tell you what, there's one institution that the love of many is never going to wax cold, and that's the church. The church will love many. It will love all because Jesus did and does. Amen? And that's what we need to do to spread that gospel of the kingdom is to go where the sinner is, go where the sick is, go where the hurting is, amen? And every time that they did that, if we keep reading in Luke chapter 9, we would see that there was healing. Not just a sniffle went away, okay? Anybody got a sniffle right now? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your sniffle can go away, amen? But more importantly, miraculous healing. And deliverance. That's what happens when you preach the gospel of the kingdom. Because when you hear that there's a guy who died for you so that you could be perfect. And all you got to do is repent and turn away from an old life. Boy, that sounds good. Because it is good. Because it changes your life. For the better. Not just your spiritual walk with God. But there's a side effect. Your physical life gets better too. Yeah, you get healed from sickness. You get delivered from disease. You get delivered from addiction. And when you get delivered from addiction, there's a whole lot of good stuff that happens because you're delivered from addiction. Amen. You stop smoking those cigarettes, and you you can breathe a little better. (laughs) Amen. You you get delivered from that alcohol. Like pastor was delivered from that alcohol. When you wake up in the morning, you, you remember what yesterday was. Amen. That's good. That's, it's got, getting filled with the Holy Ghost has got its side effects, and boy, they are good. If you, if you want to, if you want to go somewhere and get intoxicated, you got to go to church and get intoxicated with the Spirit. Amen? That's the way you get, that's the way you get drunk, is you get drunk on the Spirit. I'm so thankful I don't have an idea what it means to be drunk on the wine. I only know what the drunk in the Spirit means, and that feels so amazing to come to church. Amen. I don't come to church to get drunk on his spirit. I come to church to get in contact with him. My wife was asking me last night, what is your favorite thing to do in the world? And the first thing that came to my mind was work in the altars. Have you ever been there when somebody's getting filled with the Holy Ghost? Raise your hand if you've been there at the altar with somebody when they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Wasn't that an amazing thing? That is the most amazing miracle ever. Just like pastor, pastor has said this, he's addicted to it. I feel like that's one really good addiction. Amen. To get addicted to the, the Holy Ghost. The, what, what the Holy Ghost does in somebody's life. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, when I saw Chantel getting filled with the Holy Ghost over at Eau Claire, boy, was that amazing. To see that happen, that change in their life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, I'm almost done. Let's all stand here. Amen. Preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is always about moving people from where they are 
to where Jesus wants them to be. I just got to ask us here tonight, this morning one more time, um, where is our walk with Jesus? Have we moved completely where we want to be to where he wants us to be? Amen. And, and as we pray here this morning, um, I want us to just think about what are some distractions in our life and ask the Lord to reveal that to us. It could be something that is as trivial as just a phone device or a tablet device or a computer time. It could be something simple like that, but it could be major. It could be a major thing like I, I pray once or twice a week and they're both at church. That could be something that the Lord reveals to you. Hallelujah. I want You know, let's all come. I want to open up this altar for us here this morning just because there's a God here that needs to talk to us. And the best way to hear what he has for us is to, to pray, to talk with him in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's just thank him right now. Hallelujah. Let's ask the Lord right now. Let's bind together as a church. Go ahead, lift up your voice right now. Lift up your hands.